Hi everyone, I'm Sarah and I'm going to be reading the Bible for us tonight. So the passage is Mark chapter 3 verse 1 to 6. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Uh, Thanks, Sarah, for reading the Bible. Hey, everyone. Um, Tonight's sermon, uh, we're not going to be sitting in Mark chapter 3. It's one of the passages we're going to look at. Um, Normally in our services, we would sit in one passage and try and make sense of it. Tonight, I'm going to jump around a whole lot of places. So think of tonight as a bit of a biblical antipasto platter rather than a steak. There's lots of little different bits and pieces that we're going to work our way through. Let Let me pray and we'll get stuck in. Lord, I pray that you would help us tonight understand ourselves better, that you'd give us a greater capacity to engage with our emotions, to engage you with them. And we ask that you'd make us wise. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Emotions are pretty tricky things, yeah? Sometimes they dominate our lives. They're the landscape of everything. Sometimes they hide in the background. Um, In the room right now, there's a huge spectrum of personalities, isn't there? We all relate and respond in different ways, but all of us are emotional. If you think you're not emotional, I just want to kindly beg to differ. (laughs) We're all emotional. I wonder, how do you deal with your emotions? How do you think about your emotions? Older generations, particularly those with British Anglo backgrounds, have a particular approach to emotions, don't they? It goes a long way back into Western history, the Greeks and the Stoics. The British maybe perfected it with the stiff upper lip. It's the idea that emotions are fickle, they're dangerous, they're unreliable, that logic, reason, rationality, that's the way forward. Expressing emotion looks like weakness. Best thing to do is repress those emotions. We might not say that, but we might just say, just push them aside, push them down deep because they won't help you or anyone else. And in church, talking like talking about emotions to, to people in that kind of thinking might seem like a waste of time. Like we've left the Bible behind and now we're, we're heading into psycho babble. I wonder whether that's you or whether that's the family you grew up in. I wonder whether you think that's true or not. Is it biblical? I think in response to that particular cultural background, modern culture has probably swung the pendulum in the whole other direction. Like our culture says that we should always trust our feelings about ourselves, about others. We form identity through our feelings. We say things like, I feel rather than I think. We argue through heartfelt stories that seek to pull at the emotions. We form moral arguments through emotional stories. We find truth in the emotions of ourselves and others. I wonder, is that you? Is, that, is there truth in that? Is, is that biblical? Jesus says the greatest commandment for us is, well, for everyone, is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's like saying, love God with everything you got. Love him with everything. And that has to include your emotions. In Romans 12, Paul says that because of God's mercy, we should offer our bodies as living sacrifices. And the way that we do that is by not being conformed to the pattern of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. And our minds are not disconnected from our emotions. They're intimately connected. 
Proverbs 20, verse 5, this is a helpful verse. It says, the, pers- the purposes of a person's heart are deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out. The purposes of a person's heart are deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out. All of which means the Bible doesn't approach our emotions in a one-dimensional way. As we talk about emotions, we're heading into deep waters. Emotions are complex. We're complex. Talking about emotions is hard, isn't it? Like, I have to confess, uh, I've felt quite emotional preparing a talk on emotions. It requires honesty and insight and self-awareness. It it requires a capacity to be vulnerable, none of which comes naturally to me. It requires a great deal of humility, which certainly doesn't come naturally to me. It requires practice and time. I've kind of been cacking myself all week that me, at times an emotionally repressed middle-aged white man, is doing the intro talk on a series on emotions. It just seems a bit silly. And yet, if we Christians are to love God with everything we've got, it must include our emotions. Here's another proverb. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Jesus said exactly the same kind of thing. This is from Luke's Gospel. He says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. I wonder how often do our emotions drive the evil we speak? That's a challenge, isn't it? So before we jump into emotions, I think it's really important for us to remember a few things. Firstly, we need to remember the gospel of grace. At the heart of the Christian faith is this beautiful, wonderful truth that Christ died for our sins while we were still sinners. God doesn't save us because we're really good or really beautiful or desirable. He saves us because he is, because he's that good. His love overflows towards us. Like he knows the dark corners of our hearts, the darkest corners. He sees every emotional outburst. He sees our anger and our seething contempt. He sees our fears. He sees our misguided priorities. He sees the selfishness and pride in our hearts. He sees our thoughts. He knows our sorrows. And being our perfect father, a perfect heavenly father, he still loves us. He doesn't turn his face away from us. Jesus, in Matthew's gospel, he invites us to come to him with our burdens because he's gentle and lowly of heart. He knew exactly what he was buying when he died for us on the cross. And although sin goes deep to the very core of each of us, the good news is that God doesn't cast us away because Jesus was cast away for us. God is patient with us. He's transforming us slowly. And so if you're not a Christian here tonight, I I just want to encourage you that God offers that same grace to you today. He doesn't say, get your emotional life in order and then you can join my family. He invites you to call on his name to ask for salvation, to give your life to Jesus. Psalm 103, a beautiful psalm, says God shows us compassion because he knows that we are dust. He knows we're frail. And so I want to encourage you tonight to try and let go of the feeling that we must be immediately perfect in every way Uh, for God to welcome us or to keep loving us. God's grace towards us has to be the foundation or the starting point. If it's not, it's going to be tremendously hard for you and I to be honest about how we feel and about how we behave in light of our feelings. It's so hard to change what we're unwilling to name and it's, I think, impossible to change when we're not even willing to be honest. One thing that's also really freeing, I think, is to remember that the only human to be perfectly holy in his emotions was Jesus. Isn't that good news? It means that the rest of us are in the same boat. Everyone here has issues related to emotions. Everyone. If you think you don't, you just proved that you do. Which means, as best as you can tonight, I just want to encourage you to relax. If your anger leads you to sin, you're, just, you're not alone. If you're racked by fear and anxiety, you're not alone. If grief feels like a weighted blanket that's way too heavy that you can never get out from underneath, you're just not alone. And sometimes feelings of guilt and shame stop us from engaging with our emotions. 
And I want to encourage you as best as you can to remember God's grace as we start. That's true of us whether we're Christians or not. So like I said at the start, we're not going to sit in one passage tonight. We're going to try and draw some wisdom from a bunch of different places in the scriptures. I've already said this. I hope this is very clear. I'm not an expert on emotions. Uh, I am a middle-aged white man. We did not in my family talk a lot about emotions growing up. I'm trying to learn some vocab as we go. I'm certainly not a psychologist. I've drawn tonight from a bunch of passages, and uh, we, we had a bookstore this morning for a book called Untangling Emotions, but we, we sold out. I'm sorry. So we'll talk about maybe getting some more of those. But a really helpful book, if you want to read through on emotions, is called Untangling Emotions. But here's where I'm headed tonight. I really talk in two parts. First part, I want us to think about understanding what the Bible has to say about emotions. And then the second part, engaging our emotions. All right. So let, let's start with understanding our emotions. And I want to show you six things that we see in the scriptures that I think are helpful for gaining a big, biblical picture of what the Bible has to say about emotions themselves. Here's the first one to notice. God himself expresses emotions. Remember that passage I read at the start of the service from Hosea? God expresses tender-hearted compassion and love towards his people Israel. He expresses anger. His emotions are always holy. When Jesus shows up, the Bible says that he is the clearest and fullest revelation of God. You want to know what God is like? Look at Christ. And when Christ shows up fully human and fully God, he expresses emotion. Did you hear that in the passage that Sarah read for us? He's confronted by a man who needs healing on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees are looking at him to see what he's going to do. He's angry and grieved. And he heals the bloke, which makes me think there has to be love and compassion in there too. I mean, Jesus' healings aren't dispassionate. He doesn't go, oh, yeah, okay, you're better. He loves people. In other places in the gospel, we see the same thing. We see anger and grief at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. We see compassion for the crowds. We see him weep over Jerusalem. So God expresses emotions. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing for us to notice is that emotions are gifts from God. If Jesus experienced emotion and he's holy, perfectly holy, we can't say that emotions are bad. They're gifts. They're part of how God has made us. If we're to love God with everything, we're to love God with our emotions. Now, I think we know a lot of emotions we do experience as gift, yeah? Joy, woo, happiness, glee, contentment, peace of heart. We're all signing up for those emotions, yeah? We, we all want that. But I want to suggest that emotions that we experience as negatives are also gifts too. So, for example, grief, although it's painful, is reflective of love. Anger is the right response to injustice and evil. So we need to be careful to not moralise emotions in and of themselves. They're gifts. So God expresses emotions. Emotions are gifts. Here's the third thing for us to notice, is that our emotions are affected by sin. See, God gets angry but never sins in his anger. Anyone know the first human to get angry? Yeah, Cain, chapter 4 of the Bible, didn't take long. And what did he do in his anger? Did he write some great injustice? Did he bring social change to a broken world and help things in his anger? No, he killed his brother. He was a murderer. See, being angry isn't in itself sinful, but it often ends in destructive sinful behaviour. Sin affects our responses to things. I think about it. Sometimes we get really angry about something someone does to us, and then we go and do much the same thing to someone else, and we don't get angry about what we did. Sometimes we grieve inconvenience. Have you ever grieved inconvenience? Traffic, drive through line at Macca's is too long, like whatever. You grieve inconvenience, and yet you can be unmoved by great horrific injustices in the world and just not care. Sin affects every part of us, including our emotions, which means our emotions are not infallible guides to truth or righteousness, but they're really good guides to our hearts. We'll come back to that later. So emotions are affected by sin. Here's the fourth thing I want us to see. Emotions are really complex. In some ways, this is an overarching idea for 
everything I've got to share tonight. Did you notice when Jesus is confronted by this man in Mark chapter 3, he looks around at the Pharisees with anger and he's grieved. Anger and grief go together and then he heals the man. So there's love, there's compassion in there too. Emotions are rarely singular. Proverbs 14, 13 says, even in laughter the heart may ache and rejoicing may end in grief. In that book I mentioned understanding emotions, they say emotions are a little bit like getting paint tinted. So if you go to Bunnings and you want to get some paint of a particular colour, you choose your white paint and you take it to the desk and you ask for your particular shade. I actually looked this up, some shades. Here's some good ones. Baby Bear, Chocolate Sparkle, Tomato Bisque or Wizard Grey. Let's say you want some Tomato Bisque. Can I have some Tomato Bisque, please? You take your paint can up. And then they punch in tomato bisque and then different colours, different shades get squirted into the white and then shaken up and there you have tomato bisque. These guys who wrote the book Untangling Emotions, they say emotions function like that. It means that we rarely feel just one emotion in isolation. They mix together, which makes it hard to identify when you're staring at tomato bisque to identify all the different shades and colours that went into it. And for some of us type A personalities where we want everything to be neat and ordered and clear, emotions don't work like that. So imagine as a hypothetical, ex no, this is a real example for all of us. Imagine you've just had a heated argument with someone you love. Have you done that? Yep. During the argument, perhaps you raised your voice and expressed anger. You might still be angry after the argument. You may also feel sad or grieved at the rupture in relationship. You might feel frustrated because you want to be close to that person, but now you're not. You might feel guilt or shame because of how you behaved. Perhaps there's contempt or self-righteousness in the mix contempt for them, perhaps even self-loathing. Maybe there's pride and a refusal to admit your part, and they're all mixed together in this big tomato bisque. Emotions are complex. That's the fourth thing. Fifth, we experience emotions physically. Think, think about how emotions can affect your body. In John 11, it says that Jesus was deeply moved as he stood at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. The, the phrase in Greek is used of snorting angry stallions. He's angry in his guts. And when Mary shows up, he weeps. In Luke, he weeps over Jerusalem. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweats drops of blood. Emotions affect us physically. They affect our bodies. They affect our heart rate, our brain chemistry, our muscles, our blood pressure. Our skin can flush or we can get goosebumps. We carry anxiety, grief, emotions in our muscles. Have you ever found yourself stressed or anxious and you realize that everything in you is tense? And someone tells you, why don't you just relax your shoulders? And you realize that you've been holding them and you relax. We clench our fists. We clench our jaw. Some of us can be anxious and grind our teeth in our sleep. We, we carry emotions in our bodies. It's exhausting. It can affect our appetite. Emotions can damage our physical health, either through intense uh, expression over years and years or repression and it also means that our physical bodies affect our emotions it actually goes both ways like anyone want to be honest and say you get angry when you're hungry any yeah oh there's a few of you all right yeah the Grady's are pretty angry people like blood blood sugar affects your emotions anyone want to admit that they're not their best first thing in the morning Anyone want to admit they get really cranky or difficult to live with when tired? Yeah, Stu, you've hit the trifecta. That's good. All right. Like, our bodies affect our... Sorry, Stu. Our, our bodies affect our emotions, don't they? Uh, if you think of famous story in the Old Testament, Elijah the prophet, he has this victory at Mount Carmel. God 
throws fire down on his sacrifice. It proves that the prophets of Baal are dodgy, they're fake, but there's one God in Israel. Elijah has this great victory, and after it, when King Ahab and his wife Jezebel threaten his life, he runs off into the wilderness, and he, he meets God, and he says to God, everything is hopeless. They don't worship you. I'm the only person left in Israel who worships you. It would be better if I was dead. Like he's, he's pretty emotional. He's not speaking the truth. But God doesn't say in that moment to him, you know what, Elijah, I think you should trust me more. In fact, I think you've forgotten the doctrine of my sovereignty. Let me teach you on the doctrine of my sovereignty so that you will trust me more. You know what God does? Gives him some hot bread and tells him to have a nap. He, he knocks him out. And then when he wakes up, guess what God does? He repeats it, more bread, more sleep. This means that brain chemistry and diet, fitness, thyroids, hair loss, cancer, sleep apnea, menstruation, reflux, diabetes, menopause, acne, everything can actually affect our emotions. It means that when someone is anxious or grieving, like we heard before, telling them to just trust God more, which is something all of us should always do at every point, might be really unhelpful because it's just not that simple. Telling someone to not go to a doctor or psychologist because Jesus should be your doctor is to mix, miss the complexity of us as humans. It could profoundly damage someone. Yeah, of course, we should always go to Jesus. We're going to get there. But if God tells Elijah, if he treats Elijah physically, how unbiblical of us to ignore the physical. I hope you're getting the sense that emotions are pretty complex. You getting that? All right, here's the last part of understanding emotions. They reveal what we love and care about, which means they're connected to how we think and feel and believe about ourselves and about God. Like, Why does Jesus get angry at the Pharisees in Mark chapter 3? He gets angry at them because of the hardness of their heart. Like These leaders are supposed to be the ones who lead Israel to be a light to the world. And how would Israel be a light to the world? They'd be a place of God's justice and beauty. They'd care for the vulnerable and the downtrodden. And here is this disabled man, and they're hoping to use him to score a political and moral win over Jesus. They don't care about the man. They don't delight in the healing. They don't worship God. And in response, what do they do? They get together and plan to kill him. If that's not anger and contempt, I don't know what it is. And Jesus, he's angry at the injustice. He's angry at their sin against them. He's grieved that they won't worship. He cares about the right things. You see, our emotions reveal our heart. So, for example, um, when you get angry and yell, or when you get angry and silent, something's going on in your heart, isn't it? There are beliefs flowing in your heart about who you are, who others are, the world God that shape what you're doing. Now, you might get angry and yell because your child is about to cross a road without looking and in love and anger, you call them with all the ferocity you've got to rescue them. Or you might yell because your child accidentally spilt rice bubbles all, of, all over the floor and you really love a clean and tidy, this is a completely fictional, <laughs> it's not. You really love a clean and tidy out. There's two very different loves, isn't there? Or imagine your silence. Your silence might be a profound act of love and self-control. You know that in the heat of the moment, your anger is only going to lead you to say something that you really shouldn't say. Or it could be a weapon for you to hurt someone for weeks. Two very different loves. It's why when we're angry or overwhelmed, we often get our internal defense lawyer up and about. We've all got one. If you haven't realized that you've got a defense lawyer, just wait till someone criticizes you or says you've done something wrong and see what you say. Because most of us don't say, you know what, I'm so thankful that you've brought that to my attention. I'll think and pray on that. No, 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 we just generally defend ourselves. Something we love in that moment has been threatened and our emotions reveal it. So let me sum this up. We've looked at emotions. God expresses emotions. 
They're gifts from God. They're affected by sin. Emotions are complex. They're physical. They reveal what we love. The, the obvious question is, righto, what do we do with that? What would it look like for those of us who are Christians to grow in godliness in terms of our emotions or for our emotions to better mirror the holiness of God? Or for those of us who aren't Christians, what does the Bible encourage us towards in terms of healthy emotions? I, I want to show you four things. Here's the first one. The, the first thing I think we're called to do is engage with our emotions. So remember Proverbs 20 verse 5. It says, The purposes of a person's heart are deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out. I wonder how much attention are you giving to your emotions? Do you engage with them? Here's, here's what I mean by that. Do you ever think that there's more going on for you than that person may be mad or I'm just a bit sad? Do you ever consider the deep waters of your heart and draw insight from them? So engaging our emotions is going to mean identifying them, naming them. Uh, one day this week, as I was prepping for this talk, actually, I, I had a pretty rough emotional morning after having an argument with one of my kids. And so I'm sitting in my office, I've had an argument with one of my boys, and I'm preparing a talk on emotions by reading some stuff on emotions. And so this book on emotions tells me that I need to engage my emotions. So I'm pretty emotionally stunted sometimes, so I thought, all right, I'll give it a crack. And I sat and thought about what I was feeling in that moment, and here's what I worked out. I worked out that I was sad about the argument, I was sad about my behavior and my son's behavior. I was anxious about how I'm affecting him for bad. I was angry at myself for my sin. I was angry at him for his sin. And there's love mixed in there because I just desperately love the kid. I was grieved about several people who died recently. And in the midst of my own behavior, I felt guilty and I felt ashamed. It's a wonder we don't combust with all that going on inside of us. The, the paint tin at Bunnings, it's real. Do you ever name your emotions? Do you ever examine them? My hunch is that a lot of us just ignore them or shake them off a lot of the time. We anesthetize with our favorite thing, you know, whether it's TV or scrolling or food or sex or alcohol or gossip or shopping or work or study, whatever helps ease the discomfort, whatever helps the big emotions to just get a feel a bit smaller or go away a little bit. Some of us do go in the other direction. We live as if our emotions fully define us. We can wallow in them. Another common response that we often come to is to just sort of say something like this. When our emotions overtake us and we sin, we say, you know, the way I acted was sinful and it's because I'm sinful. And so I said sorry to God and that's it. We're done now. Now, there's truth that we do sin because we are sinful. There's truth that sin affects our emotions and that how it flows out of us. I think that response is particularly common with anger. We feel shame and so we're not able to sit in the emotions that we just experienced and expressed. What I'm suggesting is that the wisdom of Proverbs suggests we should try and examine our hearts a little more. Do you ever explore why you might feel the way you do? Do you ever give time to reflection? Do you look underneath the surface of your emotions and behavior to consider what is going on in the deep waters of your heart? God wants us to plunge in there and engage our emotions. So that's the first thing. We need to engage our emotions. And the second thing is to bring it to God. As you go into the deep waters, go to God. I mentioned before a passage from Matthew 11 where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. He invites us to come to him. Or Psalm 62 verse 8 says, Trust him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Have you ever been trying to listen to someone talk at you for a long time and you get really bored? Is that happening right now? <laughs> Like, I've, I occasionally find myself in conversations where I realise what this person is saying to me, I just don't care about. Is that ever you? You know what's amazing about God? We can pour our hearts out to him over and over again, and he doesn't go, oh, hurry up. He doesn't think, gee, I wish they'd spit it out. 
In fact, the God of the universe, who has way more on his plate than you and I ever will, actually invites us to come to him and pour our hearts out to him. He's all he is. I think the tr- part of the challenge for us is we don't have vocab for all this, right? And, and if we can be honest, sometimes I think this could be, I don't think this is a stereotype, well, it is a stereotype, but it, there's some truth into it. Us guys, we sometimes don't have as much emotional vocab. When someone asks us how we're going, we say good or not bad. <laughs> some of us might say, oh yeah, busy, tired. When pushed, perhaps we've got happy or sad or angry or meh. <laughs> But the Bible gives us such profound help to grow in this way. We've already heard a little bit about it. The Psalms are so profoundly helpful in bringing our emotions to God. They're constantly referring to feelings. They they give us holy words to express every big emotional experience. Anger, bitterness, sorrow, grief, shame, guilt, anxiety, joy, delight, or satisfaction. I just want to encourage you, read and pray the Psalms if you want to cultivate healthy, godly emotions. Like consider, here's a few examples of pouring your heart out to God, just from the first couple of Psalms in the book. Um, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. Or I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. Or why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Do do you hear it? They express emotions. Sometimes they do it directly. I'm really frustrated. How long, O Lord? Sometimes they use metaphors. You've already heard tonight the metaphor of a tsunami. The Psalms over and over will use metaphors of pits, of wallowing, of waves. And so bringing your emotions to God, it will mean pouring your heart out to him. The prophets do it. Habakkuk, Jeremiah. It's honest prayer. It's naming how you feel. It's telling him your heart. Do you ever lie to God in your prayers? Because you think it's holy? Like you say to God, yeah, God, um, yeah, this is, it's a bit tough and I'd really appreciate some help. When really in your heart you're saying, you, you feel like, I hate this God. Have you ever thought how dumb it is to pray in that way? It's like when my kids were little and they'd steal chocolate and they'd be covered in chocolate and you'd say to them, did you eat the chocolate? And they'd be like, no, I didn't eat the chocolate. I'd say, the chocolate's all over your face. And they'd say, I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) Can't trick God. Bringing our emotions to God, it'll mean also confessing the sin that lies underneath our emotions, the selfishness or pride or the disordered loves. It'll be asking him for forgiveness and help and remembering the gospel as you do. Bringing emotions to God will be asking for his help to cultivate healthy emotions and kill unhealthy ones. For example, I mean, it might mean repenting of how our anger leads to hurting others. It might be repenting of the joy we feel at the pain of others. It'll mean reading the scriptures and sitting under God's word to cultivate godly emotions, letting God's word renew how we think because that's how we're transformed. Thoughts and feelings are connected. It'll mean singing God's praises together to help reorder our affections because remembering the gospel helps to reshape our loves. Cultivating our love for Jesus helps to kick out the idols of our hearts. You've already heard an example tonight. It could mean writing a lament. It could mean finding other creative ways to express emotion, finding holy outlets. But the beauty of Jesus' offer is to come to him and learn from him, to pour our hearts out to God. Consider this. Why would God command us to pour our hearts out to him if we didn't need it? He's so kind towards us with our disordered emotions. Are you engaging God with them? So we should engage our emotions and engage God. Here's the third thing. We should get wisdom from others. Here's the truth. I don't really know myself fully, and neither do you. I don't have enough wisdom and insight to understand myself. I need wisdom from outside myself. I definitely need it from God. I definitely need it from the scriptures, but I also need it from other people. Do you ever talk about your emotions with other people? 
your fears, your anxieties, your griefs, your bitterness? Do you ever let people show you the ways in which you're blind about yourself? See, Galatians 6 tells us that we should bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I don't think he just means physical burdens. Like I saw some of you today, you helped someone move house, that's bearing burdens, but I don't think that's what Paul's really talking about. He's talking about the emotional ones, the spiritual ones, the sorrows, the griefs of life. Romans 12 that says we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds it also says, let love be genuine, outdo one another in showing honor, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. I have to be honest, I find this hard. I find it hard to share my emotions with other people. Uh, a few weeks ago, my grandfather died and I really struggled to tell people. I didn't, I didn't want people to feel sorry for me. I didn't want to burden people. And also when I'm really sad, I don't heaps want to talk anyway. And there's a place for that. Grief's at play. And please don't hear me say when something bad happens in your life, you should tell everyone. I'm not saying that at all. But I realised that I robbed myself of wisdom and comfort. Like Proverbs 12.25 says, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Do you ever share your sorrows with others? I've realised you know, my upbringing has been way more stiff upper lip. It's good to be tough and control yourself and way less of actually talk about how you're doing. But it's not just grief I find hard to share with others. I find it hard to share about my anger because of shame, but I need to. You know, the feeling that we should pretend that we've got everything together, ironically, is one of the things that stunts our growth the most. We need each other. And it's also true that the wisdom we need goes beyond our friends. We need the wisdom of psychologists and counsellors. I want to be really clear on something. To do that is not ungodly. There are some Christians who seem to think that if you really trust Jesus, you won't ever have any psychological drama and that to go to a psychologist would be sinful, akin to not trusting the Lord. And I just say, well, if you go to a physio for your back, what's the difference? If you go to a doctor for that rash, what's the difference? We go to physios for our muscles, we go to the dentist for our teeth, we go to doctors for millions of different things. Why wouldn't we go to those who've studied psychology, which if, if God created us and created our psych, our psyche, our psychology, why wouldn't we go to experts to help us with our emotions and thinking. So we need to engage our emotions, engage God with our emotions, get wisdom from others. Here's the last thing. I just want to encourage you to be patient. For some of us, it would be a huge step to name how we feel. For some of us, it would be a huge step to admit that we have feelings. <laughs> I want to encourage you to start and keep going. So over the next few weeks, we'll look at anger next week, anxiety, and then grief. I want to be so clear. These talks will not fix you. If that's what you're hoping for, that's not going to happen. They're meant to get us thinking and talking. We're hoping to help you think about your emotions in light of the gospel. And we'll continue to hear from some people and their experiences. So engaging with your emotions isn't something that you do for three or four weeks and then you nail it. It's not a skill like table tennis that you just improve quickly and then you've got it. This is not how this works. It's a lifelong pursuit. It's part of God's work to make you more and more like Jesus throughout your whole life. And God is so patient with us. And so we should be too. One of my favourite verses in the New Testament is from 1 Thessalonians 5. And it says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. And so if you're sitting here tonight and you're thinking, I've got so, so far to go, welcome. You'll fit right in. And the good news is that God is so patient with us. He's so patient with our disordered loves. And his promise is to complete the good work that he started in us 
and that work won't be finished until we're dead, which means be patient. I hope you're beginning to get a sense of the nuance in terms of how the Bible speaks of emotions. Let's love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, hey? With everything. Let's remember the gospel of grace so that we grow in our capacity to be honest about how we're feeling and all that we're experiencing and let's bring it to God and each other. Let me pray. Lord God, we thank you that you have made us with emotions. They're good gifts from you. I pray it help us to see the complexity. I pray in particular that you'd help us to engage our emotions, to pray them, to pour our hearts out to you. We thank you for your grace to us in that. I pray that we'd be a community that would walk patiently alongside one another, that we'd love one another well. I pray you'd grow those of us who are Christians more and more in the likeness of Christ. And I pray that for all of us, we would rem remember the truth of the gospel, that you rescue us, you forgive us, you save us, not because of any of our works, but because of your goodness and grace. And so for those here tonight who aren't Christians, may that grace captivate their hearts, perhaps for the first time tonight, Lord. And for those of us who have heard it before, may it captivate our hearts again. May it humble us so that we would be increasingly willing to be honest about who we are, what's going on for us, that you might mature and grow us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.